going to be uh, just introducing this session, and then I'll be facilitating some questions towards the end. Uh, as you just heard, the session is being recorded, so you are welcome to listen to it at a later date, but we're glad that you're here in person. This gives you an opportunity to not only engage uh, in, by listening to the presentation, but also to uh, pose questions to the presenter, which you can do by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen uh, and enter the questions. Uh, Benjamin will be addressing those as time permits uh, at the end of his uh, presentation. Um, my name is Kevin Mickey again. I'm the uh, past president of ERISA and currently involved in a leadership role in ERISA's uh, Climate Community Resilience Com Committee. Uh, the committee is doing a lot of great work in this area, including uh, standing up an ongoing webinar series where we bring uh, excellent speakers to uh, talk about very current relevant topics. So I'm honored to be able to present uh, Benjamin to you today. And with that, uh, Benjamin is with the uh, management, he's a management program analyst uh, with FEMA's Risk Analysis Planning and Information Directorate uh, as uh, part of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, I want to give him the maximum time possible to share all this great information he has to share. So, Benjamin, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Can you hear me all right? You can indeed. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate the kind words really set the bar really high. So hopefully we're able to uh, to reach it today. Uh, my name is Benjamin Rance. I am the project lead for the Resilience Analysis and Planning Tool. I work for FEMA headquarters on the resilience side of FEMA, really just kind of working to develop uh, different tools and resources and provide those tools and resources free um, to really anybody who is involved in emergency management um, or anybody who is involved in kind of community development and preparedness activities. So as Kevin said, we have a lot of information to get through today. I'm going to be sharing a PowerPoint slide with some information on a couple different tools that FEMA has developed. Um, it's my understanding, you know, obviously I've, I've done some ERISA events in the past. I always love working with the ERISA group. Very smart, intelligent people, great questions, great insight. So really what we're going to go through today is we'll go through the slides kind of showing some of the tools, what the information is in, uh, included in those tools. Um, it's my understanding that most people have a GIS background, and so we don't necessarily need to go into the how the tool works, but more how it's being used um, and what are some of the benefits of using some of the data that we have in the tool. So uh, everything you'll see today is publicly available. Um, I shared my slides with Kevin, happy to share them with the group. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you might have during the session as well. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll start sharing my screen. We'll get into the slides. And then, like I said, I'll, I'll check in in about 15 minutes or 20 minutes to see if we have any questions as well. So let me just share my screen really quickly. All right. <clears throat> so we're talking about some community resilience and climate change tools that we have here. So, you know, what are we really talking about? Um, just by a show of thumbs up, so if you've heard of the resilience analysis and planning tool before, go ahead and give me a, a thumbs up um, if you can. It's always good to know kind of how many people have heard of it and, you know, to see kind of who has a background on it. Um, so we're going to talk about the, the RAF uh, that specifically focuses on climate resilience. We have uh, a number, we have over 100 different data layers in RAF. Then we have a number of analysis tools in there as well. In addition to RAFT, we're going to be talking about the newly updated Climate Risk and Resilience Portal, or CLIMER. So if you've heard of CLIMER or used CLIMER, go ahead and give me a thumbs up as well. Um, this is uh, really kind of looking at future conditions data. We're talking about dynamically downscaled future conditions data, really for a suite of different future conditions, such as precipitation, maximum minimum temperatures, wildfire risk, and so on. So all of the tools and all the data layers and the tools that you'll see um, in resilience analysis and planning tool are free um, and they're publicly available. Um, we have updated them. Uh, we have, we're pulling from authoritative data sources. Um, and in addition to these tools, I'm actually gonna talk about a couple of complementary tools as well. Some of you might've heard of the National Risk Index or the NRI. Uh, we do have the NRI layer in RAFT, so you'll be able to see that. And then we also have another dashboard that we just developed called the Grant Equity Threshold Tool. I'll mention that really quickly and kind of show people that if we have time at the end. And then we're going to get into the fun stuff after the PowerPoint and really do some, some live demos of these tools. So 
keep your questions coming. Uh, feel free to ask them in the Q&A. Uh, let us know if you need anything in the chat, and uh, we'll get started. <clears throat> so the resilience analysis and planning tool. So for those of you who have already heard this, um, I apologies, but for those of you who may be new to RAT, um, it is a free, no login required, uh, we call it a GIS capability. And just to kind of take a step back, the purpose of the resilience analysis and planning tool is to allow non-GIS specialists or non-GIS analysts um, allow them to take a look at certain data layers, um, whether it be community demographic information, infrastructure, or hazards, weather, and risk, to have a better picture of community resilience at their level, whether that's at a city or municipal level, whether it's at the county level, or even at the state level. So we can't obviously replace a GIS analyst, nor would we want to. Um, this is really kind of designed for local emergency managers who maybe don't have a specialist on their, you know, list of staff or maybe don't have the resources um, to have one. So um, it's designed for people who aren't GIS specialists. And in that way, we, we try to make it pretty easy to use um, and as straightforward and simple as possible. So we take over 100 different preloaded GIS layers that I mentioned. Um, we add some pretty easy to use analysis tools that we, you know, things like a filter or population counter. Um, obviously, you can add your own data layers to it as well. So you can do that by searching ArcGIS online. We actually have a curated list of layers that I'll show you in the tool. You can pull in REST services or you can upload local files as well. And then obviously, it's important to be able to download and export this information to different spreadsheets. So one of the things that we have in RAPT is our focus on community resilience. So FEMA, over the past few years, has conducted a literature review of all of the available peer-reviewed and published literature focusing on social vulnerability and community resilience. And what we did is we took that, we applied our methodology to it, and then we're able to, to narrow down to 22 different community resilience indicators. And this is based on the literature review and what the scientific community has pretty much agreed contribute to or could be potential challenges to community resilience. So a lot of you might have heard of CDC's SVI, the Social Vulnerability Index. Obviously, you get an overall vulnerability score, and then they have four sub-indices that you get scores for. Um, but what we do is we try to take the next step in not only providing uh, each census tract and county with a value for the Community Resilience Challenges Index, or the CRCI. We express that in the form of a percentile. But what we do is we provide you with the indicators for all 22 uh, and the values for all 22 indicators that comprise the CRCI. So you can see there, not only do we provide you with a percentile value for the 22 indicators available at the county or the census tract level, we give you that information for each of those indicators. Now you might be asking what those indicators are. Uh, this slide kind of demonstrates that uh, typically we have data information, of, uh, we have data available at the county level, the census tract level, and at the tribal and territorial levels as well. And you can see our layers that are listed right there. Um, 22 of those uh, go together to comprise our CRCI, the Community Resilience Challenges Index. And then we've actually included a, a handful of additional layers based on feedback from emergency managers in the field. Now we're pulling this data from the American Community Survey through the Census Bureau. We're using their five-year estimates. Right now we currently have 2017 to 2021 data, and we have just pulled all of the data for these indicators for the newly released ACS data from 2022. So around mid-May, we will be updating the resilience analysis and planning tool to reflect the five-year estimates and averages from 2018 to 2022. So every year this tool is updated with the most recently released authoritative data from the American Community Survey that's available. So uh, we will be doing that. And typically it's around late spring, early summer every year when we're able to update RAP. And so the, the demographic information that you'll see in it is static data pulled from mostly from ACS. <clears throat> in addition to our indicator information, we have information on infrastructure as well. This is pulled from the high field, the Homeland Infrastructure Foundation level data. It's their open source uh, data layers that we're pulling from. Typical things that you'll see, you know, hospitals, nursing homes, fire stations, power plants, public schools. These are all pulled as REST services. So when Highfield updates their data layers on their side, they will reflect and be updated um, in the wrapped as well. Again, we know Highfield has a secured 
uh, area as well. But obviously, with this being a publicly available tool, we're not pulling anything that is behind a firewall or a password or anything. These are all the publicly available open data sources that we're pulling together. And in addition to the infrastructure and indicator layers, I also mentioned we have hazards, weather, and risk. So you can see a number of our different data layers. We have historical information like on tornadoes and hurricanes. We have current risk information. So we have the FEMA flood hazard zones. We have the national risk index. Uh, so we have the expected annual loss and a number of other data points for their 18 natural hazards that they have. Um, and then you can see we have some real-time weather layers as well. I, these are my favorite ones to look at. You know, we have real-time weather radar. We have weather watches and warnings. We even have some outlook layers as well for excessive rainfall and things like climate and fire and weather and stuff. So, you know, kind of taking a look at these, you know, combining these tools with, uh, combining the data layers with some analysis tools. Again, users can add their own data. Uh, we have some pretty basic tools. We have a filter tool, you know, set your parameters and take a look at infrastructure or indicator layers um, based on those parameters. And then we have things like the population counter and the incident analysis tool, which allow us to provide estimates for, um, you know, total population within an impacted area or kind of a summary of all of the infrastructure entities within a specific area. So kind of, you know, our thought is, you know, a typical user who maybe isn't a GIS professional, they would be able to, you know, do an easy search through ArcGIS to add a specific layer. In this case, you know, let's say we want to add nuclear power plants. When they click on that entity, they get the pop-up with the information, and then we provide them with opportunities to either set it as the location for our incident analysis tool or for our population counter. So you can see on the right there, um, we have set it for our incident analysis tool, and this is just an example of if I am a local emergency manager with a nuclear power plant in my jurisdiction and I'm working on um, an emergency plan for that entity, uh, we get, you know, you can easily set a 50 mile radius. And so what we're looking at are all of the hospitals within a 50 mile radius of that specific nuclear power plant. And again, just trying to keep it as straightforward as possible for anybody who's not a GIS specialist, like myself, I am not a GIS specialist. Um, we look at the same entity, but we use our population counter to get population estimates. Um, this is looking at a 10 mile radius of the same nuclear power plant and we can see we have through our population counter an estimate for the total number of individuals within that 10 mile radius. And then you can see the list on the, on the right. Any of those indicators, we can get population estimates for those. So we can see within that 10 mile radius, out of the 245-ish thousand people that are there, we have about 22,000 uh, with a disability. So just little ways, and this kind of shows how the tool is being used um, on, a, on a pretty daily basis. Um, and kind of what the purpose of RAPT is. You know, this is kind of to provide additional information to a local emergency manager um, who might need to have a little bit of insight on that. So really our, our goal is to have RAPT, you know, analysis and community analysis through different layer combinations and then by using some of the um, uh, analysis tools that we have in there as well. So another example we like to give um, that we've used in, in the uh, real world situations as well is hurricane evacuation or storm evacuation. We can draw what a potential, you know, storm path is, you know, for a local emergency manager, if I wanted to say, okay, let's have a hypothetical tornado or a hurricane or winter storm come through this area. Here's my impacted area. Show me all the infrastructure, you know, that's inside that area and also outside that area. We can take a look and prioritize different hospitals for evacuation support. We can take a look at the locations and then you know, we combine that with our community demographic information. You can see also within our storm path, we have uh, census tract information on households with limited English. You know, so as a local emergency manager, how are we using these, the GIS tool and these data layers to better understand our community, to perform that outreach and to make sure that we are, you know, connecting with individuals who might need, you know, forms of outreach or communication outside of the standard channels that we usually use. In addition to that, you know, I mentioned some of my favorite layers are from the National Weather Service. We're pulling in, you know, their live flood warning layers. So we have uh, a flood warning here. We can take a look at all of the critical infrastructure within it. And then by, you know, providing the functionality of using that specific flood warning boundary as you know, the input for our population counter, we can get estimates for the total population. We can get estimates for vulnerable you know, populations as well, age over 65, disability, things like that. 
taking a look at infrastructure and then also taking a look at our community resilience challenges index percentiles to see where are certain census tracts that might have greater challenges to resiliency. So that's a little bit about RAPS. You know, I think a lot of people, uh, we, we've done a, we've tried to do a good job of kind of socializing that tool and making sure that everybody knows that it's available and it exists. Um, one of the newer tools that we've recently partnered with Argonne National Laboratory and AT&T to develop is the Climate Risk and Resilience Portal. So I will say I am not the POC or the expert on the Climate Risk and Resilience Portal, um, but uh, I have been fortunate enough to see a number of different demos and to kind of participate, you know, with the same team that built RAP is the team that built Climber. So again, Climber is also free, open access. Um, it's an interactive web-based portal. Um, and because it's through the Argonne National Laboratory, they have uh, one of the largest supercomputers in the world. And so they're able to basically dynamically downscale climate forecast data. Um, and then with the goal of being able to use this data to contextualize how different climate change factors in the future will can factor into equity considerations, right? Um, specifically, you know, this was used to see you know, where can we put critical infrastructure that is avoiding some of the, you know, potential and likely future impacts of increases in precipitation in certain areas in the United States or increases in wildfire risk. You know, I, um, companies can use this information to say, you know, if we're, if we're building cell phone towers, do we want to put them in an area that's ex expected to have 50 or 60 percent more wildfires in the, in the next 50, 60 years? Or do we want to try to put them in areas um, where we can avoid maybe some of that loss as well. So again, the whole idea behind Climber is this dynamical downscaling data. You know, we're taking, you know, course resolution data, turning it into community level data. This is at the 12 kilometer grid. Um, they are gonna have future releases, hopefully by the end of this year, which will be at a four kilometer grid, which is really great. And really this downscale data, we're looking at different global climate models. And we're looking at two different scenarios. One is a high emission scenario. Um, you can see that it's RCP 8.5. And then we have kind of like a lower emission scenario that is uh, in line with the Paris Accords, which is RCP 4.5. So again, also widely publishing um, their modeling and their methodology into that. And so with taking this data, there are two different ways we can look at it. One is location summaries. So like I said, they break everything down into 12 kilometer square grids. So you can click on any point on the map, so wherever that point is, it's within a 12 kilometer square grid, then you can quickly summarize all of the variables for that single location. So you can get things like what is your historical mid-century or end, end of century, you know, average annual temperatures, precipitation, wildfire risk, wind speed. Um, you can kind of, with the, the newest version of the updated tool, you can change, like if I want to look at temperature at mid-century for high emissions or temperature at end of century for low emissions, you can kind of dictate what you're looking at. So we're actually going to show that um, in the future as well. And that's location summaries available for a single location, again, a 12 kilometer square grid, or we can use map explorers. So for instance, I like this one because as a non-GIS um, professional, you can take a look at this and look at the legend and say, okay, based on you know, our change in historical annual precipitation versus end of century with the lower emissions model, where are we going to have more precipitation? Where are we going to have less precipitation? And again, these are all estimates. This is our best guess um, and projections of the future. You obviously can't predict the future, um, but you know, this is still a way to kind of take a look and say, you know, what areas are going to experience maybe more drought versus more precipitation. Again, this is taking a look, you know, using our map explorers and looking at the maximum daily temperatures in the summer. So we can see historical on the left and mid-century with our high emission scenario on the right. You can see where those differences are and you can see maybe what specific populations might be more impacted by those. And then one thing we can do is, you know, we, I talk about how these tools are complementary. We can take data from RAPT, add it to Climber. So not only, not only are we looking at, you know, these maximum summer temperatures and we have this future forecast data, we can add our uh, infrastructure information, such as nursing homes. You can see those, the purple dots in the kind of center upper part of that picture. Those are our nursing homes. Are they located in areas 
that are going to be experiencing higher temperatures. Um, you can also include indicator information. So we can see, you know, if our, you know, our current populations, where are some of these census tracts that have greater challenges to resilience? And are they going to be in these areas, you know, mid-century or end of century that might be experiencing, you know, harsher, tougher climate conditions? In addition to taking wrapped data, putting it in climber, you can actually, we have preloaded climber layers that we can, that we have in the resilience analysis and planning tool as well. So we can say, okay, if we are given, you know, certain areas that are going to experience a great change in precipitation, like we noticed, if we can take a look at some of these darker areas that are going to experience more precipitation. We can use our population counter tool, or we can use our uh, incident analysis tool to take a look at the population demographics or the critical infrastructure within those areas. So really it's using the two tools separately depending on what function you need them for and what you're looking at, but being able to combine the data to also get a more holistic view um, of community resilience. And I'll, I'll dro actually drop this link in the chat. This is, we have a wrapped resource center, a number of different pieces of information. So again, with these tools being designed to be used at a, at a daily level and a local emergency management level, you know, we really wanted to make sure that we built a robust support and resource center for them. We have overviews, we have specific use cases, we have specific information on the indicator analysis, how we came up with the 22 community resilience indicators. We have all of our data sources listed, which I'll be sure to, to show and share with everybody. We have a user guide, we have FAQs, we have instructional videos for RAPT and Climber and the Grand Equity Threshold Tool. So just providing a number of pieces of information so somebody feels comfortable you know, using and you know, learning about these tools. And then we always wanna hear from people, so we provide a way for people to reach out to us. I'm sure many of you probably know this, but I would like to mention FEMA does have a public facing geospatial resource center we have a number of different tools in the Geospatial Resource Center. I actually have them broken down. You can do explore specific, like hazard specific tools and resources. So you can take a look at those. Um, you can explore all of the public facing tools that FEMA has, you know, including the resilience analysis and planning tool is in there. And just for an example in the upper right, you know, we have, you know, information on, you know, radiological emergency preparedness or rep, you know, so what we can do is a lot of these tools, like I said, they're complementary. I can take the layers from that rep tool and I can actually add them into RAPT. So I can say, you know, where are the different nuclear reactors or power plants in the United States? And then how does the how are the population demographics around those areas? What does critical infrastructure look like around those areas? So just a number of different tools and ways to look at important information, um, specifically using the GIS capability. So right now I'm going to stop sharing. I do want to check in with Kevin to see if there are any questions that we want to uh, answer before I go into a live demo of the tools. Uh, no questions yet. However, I know some people have asked me, Benjamin, one, you mentioned that some of these uh, wrap layers are based on REST services. So as they're updated, um, the wrap representation of them is updated as well, obviously. So they are the most current. Is that pretty consistent for most of the data that you have? Yes. So uh, we are in charge of updating, although well, we're in charge of updating in wrapped all of the demographic data. So we pull that once the ACS releases it, we update it, we QAQC it. So every year we can guarantee that that data, once it's updated in wrapped, is the most recently released data. For the infrastructure layers, like from Highfield, it, the, the validity of the data in RAPT is all based on the frequency with which Highfield updates their data layers. So you'll see sometimes we'll have people reach out to us and say, this hospital closed a couple months ago, but it's still showing us open in RAPT. And uh, I'll just go ahead and, and share my screen a little bit. We actually provide um, information on our data sources page that I'm sharing right now on how to reach out if something doesn't look right, either to the census, to Highfield or to the National Weather Service, if like for instance, you are you know, living in an area and you know that something has closed but it's not reflected in Highfield. Um, so we pull them as REST services, but it's up to Highfield since they own the data sets and they're, that's the authoritative source as to the frequency with which they update them. Any other questions before we jump into a demo? 
Um, actually, one other question just popped in. Uh, how is what you're showing different than um, the C CMRA, the climate mapping and resilience, uh, climate mapping for resilience and adaptation assessment tool? Yeah, the, the, the camera. Um, I, mm. I, I'm not as familiar with the, the camera as I am, obviously, with Wrapped and with Climber. I will say the indicator analysis that we performed and the literature scientifically driven process for identifying these 22 commonly used community resilience indicators and mapping them and talking about how they're correlated to each other, that is unique to RAT. Um, that is something that our office did. Um, so the information like when I show in RAT and we're looking at the CRCI, like that is something that was specifically developed by our office and included in RAT. So it could be pulled into other, I guess, tools but it is designed and it was, uh, it was designed by our team. So I know that's something that's specifically unique to RAPT. Um, and then the data sources, again, we, we we're saying, you know, we're pulling them from the authoritative uh, sources. So, you know, there could be other tools. I know a lot of tools that FEMA pull from high field as well. They also could pull different ACS data. Um, I think you'll see what is unique from what we've done is the binning process. So you'll see when we toggle some layers on what that looks like um, and then identifying these 22 community resilience indicators that comprise the CRCI. So here in our data sources page, we have our um, demographic information listed with the table we're pulling them from. Here's our high field layers with links to the rest services and then here are links to all of our hazards, weather and risk layers as well. So. Again, making sure we're very open and honest with all of our data sources we're pulling them from, user guides and FAQs. Um, here's the user guide. We have a video right here, a number of FAQs, you know, especially about exploring the data, data sources, and update frequency. You know, I encourage anybody who's interested in learning more about RAPT and potentially using it to take a look at these FAQs to kind of answer any questions that you might have. Um, so now going into the resilience analysis and planning tool, I have it right here pulled up. I'm actually in uh, Minneapolis right now for a conference. So I'm just going to zoom in up here and take a look at this area just because I happen to kind of be over here. So if, if we're looking at kind of like a state level view, there's a couple things that uh, we can do. So one, you know, we have all of our tabs up here. We have available, uh, we have all the, our demographic data available at the county the census tract, and at the tribal levels. So if we're talking at the county level first, again, whenever we have a boundaries layer on, we click on that, we get the CRCI value for that specific county. And then I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger. We get indicator information. We get the values for the indicators at that county level as well for all 22 community resilience indicators. So if I am looking from a state level perspective and I wanna know you know, where are our highest concentrations of counties maybe that have individual, you know, population age 65 and over. It's easy to toggle that on. We can take a look at these. I can click on one of the counties. It gives us information about what the value is for that indicator, about 32, 33%. And then for some of these, you know, since we're pulling this information from the Census Bureau, we have additional information in the background so we can view this in the attribute table. Anything, any of these layers that we see, you know, visibly on the map or in the pop-up, we can actually see in the attribute table as well. So we can go through, take a look at these uh, different data layers, and now we have, you know, age 65 and over is our indicator layer, but we actually have additional information at five-year increments of the estimate for the number of individuals in each of these five-year increments, these five-year kind of time slots. So. Um, so that's information at the county level. You know, we can take a look at disability as well if we were looking at that. You know, it's pretty easy to toggle on and off, click on it, get a pop-up. We can view this information in the attribute table. At the tribal level as well, uh, we also have all of our, our tribes, all our federally recognized tribes in here. We can toggle on our tribal boundaries layer. Once we do that, we click on a tribe. We'll get the information about that tribe population. And again, I'll just make this a little bigger. All of the community resilience indicators uh, that have information available at the tribal level, we have the values for those indicators right here. So again, trying to take a look at some of that information. Um, I'll, I'll zoom in on the Minneapolis area because this is where I am right now, Minneapolis, St. Paul. 
And then, you know, I think one of the values and one of the benefits of resilience analysis and planning tool is really looking at this census tract information. You know, we can kind of get in here and really take a look at some of these indicators. So if I'm at the city level and I'm saying, okay, if I'm looking at Minneapolis or St. Paul, where do we have our highest concentrations of percentage of the population age 65 and over? We can toggle this on, see where those are, and I can click on one of these census tracts. And now, just like we have for county and tribal, it'll actually give us information and the value for this indicator at that level. That's at the census tract level. One thing, you know, I, I live in the Midwest, you know, and I think connectivity is something that we're all kind of talking about and looking at recently. Um, so one thing I like to do is let's just zoom in on, you know, northern Minnesota and we'll say one of the indicators we have is households without a smartphone. So we can toggle that on and we can see, you know, if we're looking at, you know, this darker blue area, where are some of these areas that have, you know, higher percentage of the households without a smartphone? We can see where these are. Some of these, it looks like, you know, this is 31, almost 32%. Here we have, you know, 31% over here. Um, and then if I actually wanted to also look at population without a broadband subscription, I can take a look at some of these darker red uh, census tracts which correlate to higher percentages of that. So here we have, you know, 47% with a broadband subscription. So from a FEMA perspective, when I hear us say, you know, we're going to send you a link to your phone that you can click on and go online to update your application or something like that, I think sometimes, it, you know, anybody who does that, we're doing a disservice to those folks who live in these census tracts who, you know, 40% without a broadband subscription and 32% of households without a smartphone. You know, how are we making sure that we're tailoring our outreach and our communication strategies to adjust and account for these pockets of areas where we don't have individuals with a smartphone or we don't have you know, households with broadband subscription? So just wanted to kind of show that really quickly. Again, the whole point with the tool is to kind of layer a bunch of different uh, layers, uh, combine a bunch of different layers on top of each other to kind of get a more full picture. Um, just showing some of our analysis tools. So again, if we're looking at the state level and I'm looking at things like hospitals, you know, we can click on any of these, we get a pop-up with the information about it, the number of beds and everything. Um, if I'm a, a state level emergency manager, if I wanna just look at, you know, entities for my state, we do provide a pretty simple uh, filter tool uh, for some of these indicators or, or on, and, and infrastructure entities. You can see them here. We actually have them preloaded um, with different fields so I can, you know, enter my state, you know, we already have, you know, people might want to filter by state. We can toggle that filter on. So now I'm just looking at hospitals, you know, in Minnesota, we can filter by county if I wanted to as well. So, you know, I could filter by, you know, any of these different counties if I wanted. Um, and you can actually filter by city or type of hospital as well. So trying to make it as easy as possible. Uh, for those of you who are, you know, you want a little bit more out of the tool, we actually have a custom filter option as well. So like down here, you can create a custom filter. And this is where you can look at specific census tracts or specific indicators. Um, you can just pick kind of whatever layer you're looking at, and then you can just add your expressions. So instead of the, the four or five that are preloaded, you can actually, you know, filter by any of these, uh, the data fields that we have. Um, you can filter by like, you know, the number of beds is above 50 or, you know, you can filter by different city or anything you want. This is really helpful when we're looking at different community resilience indicator layers um, is to, to kind of go into that custom filter and be able to do that. So I spent a lot of time just kind of playing around with that. In addition to some of these, I'll take a look at some of our hazard layers. Uh, so again, we have historical information. So for instance, if we were looking at historical tornado tracks, um, let's just zoom in on the Minneapolis area right here. This is an example I provided uh, at the conference you know, let's say we wanted to do some planning efforts and we wanted to say, okay, we have a historical tornado track. What if this same tornado hit today? What are the critical infrastructure that are going to be impacted? Again, just setting this as the location for our incident analysis tool. And the idea is, you know, pretty easy to understand, easy to use, you know, setting our buffer distance of two miles and say, okay, here's our historical entity. If this were to hit again, what critical infrastructure would be impacted? we can take a look at hospitals within there. We can see where they are. We can see the names and the, the information for them. And again, any of this information can be downloaded. So you can download this, you can export it to an Excel, taking a look at nursing homes. If we wanted to take a look at those, where those are located, 
uh, the names of them. Um, we actually did this exact example in at early of 2022. So in December 2021, there were some tornadoes that went through torn um, Tennessee and Kentucky. And we had teams deployed and they reached out to us saying, can we use RAPT to determine which houses of worship or churches uh, are within like a one mile radius of the actual tornado pass that went through? Because right now we're just Googling it. We're searching for it and we're trying to look on a map. And is this within a mile? Is it not? And how do we reach out to them? So we were able to do this exact thing. You know, we added the tornado layer. We used it as the input for incident analysis tool, set our buffer, and we were able to show them all of the critical infrastructure that was within you know, one mile radius of the specific tornado path that had just gone through. So, you know, instead of, you know, spending hours, you know, searching for it and then having to kind of narrow down which ones are included, we did this, export the layer, you know, you can download it, you can save it on your computer, and then, you know, you can use that as a starting point. The biggest thing with these tools is they're all complementary to each other and they're all great starting points. You know, it's, I, I kind of liken it to the Lord of the Rings. You know, this is not like the Lord of the Rings where there's one tool to rule them all and there's one tool that provides every single answer and every single data set for every question you have. It's a combination of different tools. Um, and I think Raft is a really great place to start when we're looking at things like this and when we take into consideration kind of what local emergency managers typically look at. Um, so uh, if we're looking at hazards, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit. You know, I mentioned some of my favorite layers are the weather watches and uh, warnings. So if we toggle those on, we can see kind of on a national level what those look like. So for instance, up here, it looks like in North Dakota, it looks like we have some of these uh, special weather statements. So I could take a look at what that is. I could click on more info, it would give me that alert. And then one of the biggest tools that I think a lot of local emergency managers enjoy about RAPT is I can take this set this as the input of my population count. And now during this specific area, let's say, you know, this is a special weather statement, let's say it was a flood warning or something, we can use this as the input for our population counter. You'll say it says use the resolving feature because we're not drawing our area, we're not selecting a radius or anything, we're using this specific feature. And I wanna get the total population that's in that area, hit run, and it will be able to calculate that for me. Um, and then, you know, once I get a total individuals that can take a look at any of those specific indicators that we mentioned earlier, you know, age over 65, disability, without a vehicle, stuff like that. So the idea is being able to take a couple clicks, um, use the various different data sets and data layers in RAPT with the tools to really take a look at, you know, what, you know, potential risks could be and how many individuals could be impacted by these. You know, 72,900, we could go back here and now we can say, you know, how many of those individuals are over 65, hit run, and it will update and give us that information. Another thing that I, another functionality point that I like to show is, let's say I want to look at all of these census tracts that are within this area. Anytime we see the three dots, we obviously have additional options. I can view this in the attribute table, and now I'm looking at all of these census tracts that are within this uh this area that I have selected here, and I can go through and now all the information from the census tracts, high school diploma, CRCI, age 65 and over, disability, and so on, is all listed here. So I can actually take this and I can export this. So now I can prioritize and I can, once I have it in Excel, I can sort, you know, if I'm looking at households without a smartphone, sort highest to lowest. And so I can take a look at the top three or four census tracts um, that have households without a smartphone. This is really kind of the information and the functionality that local emergency managers have said is really, really crucial and really important um, for their everyday work. I do want to show just really quickly how to add data, and then we're going to talk about Climber, and then I'll leave, you know, 10 minutes at the end uh, to make sure that we have time for questions, or if anybody says, hey, show me this, or, you know, show me that, uh, what can we look at? I'm happy to take a look at those. Benjamin, I'm a, so, if you don't mind, I'm going to interject a question yeah. real quick because it, it bears a good yeah. demo. Um, earlier on, there was a terrific question about um, whether you're going, whether you're, the fact that you're still using the 2021 U.S. Census American Community Survey data and the December version came out, before, or I'm sorry, the 2022 version came out in December. 
Uh, and the question was, how soon are you going to update that? But there's an additional opportunity there that I think is really important for you to point out, which is what version of ACS you're using, which is five years, not the one year. And so if you want to maybe show where they can find that information in the metadata and perhaps talk about why you chose the five year over the one year, suspect margin of error, um, that would that might be useful. Because a lot of some of the folks on the call, I'm pretty sure are not familiar with census data. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So we the 2022 data was released in December, and we are currently in the process of updating Wrapped. So if we go to our data sources page, you'll see that currently in Wrapped we are using the five year estimate. So again, it's according to I guess the methodology and the scientific literature, the five year estimate reduce a margin of error. Um, as opposed to going every year by every year and using the same data tables, right? So when you use five-year estimates, it kind of insulates that data from outliers and provides you a better idea of what the actual demographic information is on the ground. Um, and we are actually, we pulled the data back in December. Every year when we update wrapped, that's what we do. We pull the most recently released data from the ACS. We spend about four or five months going through calculating that data because you'll see the, the data that we get from ACS does not come in this form where it's binned to all of these different census tracts, right, and these thresholds. This is the data, this is the methodology and the work that we do with the ACS data. So when we pull all of the raw data, it's QAQCing it, making sure that what they're measuring are the, exact, are the same indicators that we have here that we measured the previous year. And then we have to go through and you apply our methodology for binning this data. So with the ACS data just comes as raw data. We put it through this binning process and this visualization process for every county census tract and tribal area um, across the United States. So that takes a lot of time. Um, so that's why mid-May, RAF will be updated with the most recently released ACS data, which will be the five-year estimates, and it'll say ACS 2018 to 2022. So every year, we plan on updating it with the most recently released data. As soon as the ACS and the, the Census Bureau releases that data, we take it and start to put it through our methodology to make sure that it is binned and visualized and in wrapped. Um, uh, and is as accurate as, um, as possible. So that's a, a great question. Every year it's updated, and we, uh, the, the reason it takes a while for us to put it in there is because it's a lot of data. You know, there are over 80,000 census tracts in the United States, um, and we're pulling at least 22 uh, community resilience indicators for each data for each census tract, QAQCing all of that data, um, you know, putting it through the methodology, bending it, visualizing it. It just, it just takes a lot of time. So our tech team is, is currently working on that. Any other aspect of that question that I missed, Kevin? Nope, I think you got it, unless you want to show them where to find the information about the metadata. Yeah, uh, for any of our, our layers as well, um, you know, so like I said, we're looking at population with a disability. We can show the item details for any of the layers in wrapped. Um, it'll show you kind of where we're pulling them from five-year estimates, what table it is. And then, uh, you know, if you take a look at the layer, it's the census tract population with the disability. All of this information can actually be found on the ACS website as well. Um, so in here, we can find the metadata right here if we wanted to. So um, again, you know, typically our, our users wouldn't go into the metadata, um, but if you want to, you know, we always make sure we include it in the show item details. And that's true for our hazards and our infrastructure layers as well. You can always take a look at those. Uh, we talked about adding data layers, so I just wanted to show how pretty easy that is. Again, we can search for different data layers here through ArcGIS Online. You can enter REST services by just pasting them here. You can enter local files. Um, and we actually have a curated list of data layers based on the feedback we receive from a lot of people. So if we can look at our wrapped suggested layers, we have current wildfires, precipitation forecast, drought intensity. We have additional poverty status variables, so we can take a look at these. The national shelter system, we can see where we have open shelters, air quality monitoring, a lot of different stuff. 
Um, the, the biggest layer I would say that we typically use in here is our communities layer. So, you know, life doesn't happen at the census tract or county or tribal boundary uh, level all the time. Um, so we have our communities data layer in here. So we can add that. So if we wanted to look at things like townships, cities, villages, now we can click on it. And instead of looking at just census tracts or counties, like this is the city of Minneapolis. Um, and now we can see our city boundary right here. Then once we have this, we can use this as the input for our population counter or our incident analysis tool. So if I'm a city planner or a local emergency manager for a township or a village, you can actually take a look at all of these different little entities as, uh, as well, and then use and these county boundaries interacting with our tools too. Um, so pretty easy to add data layers um, to and remove them from RAPT. I do wanna talk about Climber a little bit, uh, and then we can uh, see if we have any additional questions. Uh, the Climate Risk and Resilience Portal, uh, we do have a link to it on uh, the RAPT page. We actually have a whole Climber tab, so you can take a look at it there. Um, but Climber, the Climate Risk and Resilience Portal, this was just updated recently within the last month. And we have basically three different parts to it. We have all of the data, which you can use see in their data catalog. They have local climate projections and national map explorers. So I'm just going to look at local climate projections first. So what this is, is kind of like I was mentioning, it's a 12 kilometer square grid where it will load on the map. I'm just gonna, you can go through on how to use this tool. But I'm just gonna close that. I'm gonna stay focused up here in Minneapolis if we want, Minneapolis, St. Paul area. And what we can do is if you click on the map, it will say, okay, this within this 12 kilometer square grid. And it gives you by default, the, the degree days, heating degree days, historical and, uh, mid-century with the high emissions and then cooling degree dates, historical and mid-century with high emissions. And then we have some like maximum average temperatures and minimum average temperatures. So what I can do is a couple different things. The, the amazing part about this tool is it generates reports for you, which is a functionality we are hoping to have in wrapped once we complete this update by May, but it can create a PDF of all of our current variables. So let's say we are looking at current degree days I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger. And what it does is it creates a temperature projection. It gives you the area info of what you're looking at with a couple of the different indicators that we're actually looking at um, here in RAPT. And then it has the different climate stats. So it has some information about it in qualitative form right here. So you can kind of read about it. And then it has your tables right here. So you're looking for instance, annual heating degree days, we can take a look at what our historical is. We can look at our mid-century with our high emissions. And for anything that they have available data for, you can take a look either historical versus mid-century, low and high emissions, or end of century, low and high emissions. Again, this is pretty easy. Just a couple clicks, we can run that report. And let's say for this specific grid, I want a report of all of the variables. We can just generate the report for all of the variables. And again, we zoom in, it has information about it. And now we're not only just talking about temperature, but we have things like heat index right here. We have different wildfire information, precipitation and wind speed as well. So as climber continues to get more information and more data layers, those will continue to be updated. Um, <clears throat> just like with wrapped, it's a little bit different view and visualization, but you can toggle on different layers. So instead of looking at temperature right here, let's say I did wanna look at precipitation. And I want to say, okay, mid-century annual precipitation, what does that look like? We can see days without precipitation. Historically, what we have, we can see at mid-century with the low emissions and mid-century with high emissions, what that looks like. And then we have annual precipitation totals, historically uh, low emissions and high emissions for mid-century. And then if you scroll down, we can have a number of different layers as well. So you can toggle these layers on. We have resilience layers. So, layers. so for instance, you know, population age 65 and over, the CRCI layers. We can toggle these on and see what they look like on the map as well to see kind of what the population could be impacted by these changes. And we have a number of infrastructure layers as well. Again, these were these are all not pulled from RAPT because we're pulling them from Highfield, um, but uh, you'll see a number of similar layers in here. So lots of great reports and insight into this area right here if we're looking at Climber. The other uh, tool and climber are the National Map Explorers. I think this is really helpful 
for folks who just really want a good visualization of what potential changes we could have. So let's take a look at precipitation, right? So we'll go to the map, you'll see it'll open up like a different map explorer for us. Sometimes it'll say, I think there's a layer that's causing this. It, if it gives you a sign in, if you hit cancel, it will still let you go to the map. And yeah, we can see the snap layer uh, can be added right now. I'm sure our tech team is working on that. And so what we can do is we can toggle on a number of different layers. So let's say we wanted to take a look at these precipitation layers and you know we're up in Minnesota, we can click on one of these little areas and it will give us the information, historical, season, uh, high emissions mid-century, high emissions end of century, right? So we can take a look at all of the information, look at the time period, look at the seasons, and then we can toggle on some of these different layers. So for looking at precipitation, right? Right now, this layer that we're looking at is precipitation daily mean historical summer. We have all of these layers that we can take a look. I like to see changes in uh, precipitation. So change in annual total historical and end of century at a high emissions. So we can take a look at this. So this is looking at historical versus end of century with a high emission scenario. And we can take a look at what that looks like on a national basis, right? And with our legend, we can see what these different colors mean. And then obviously by clicking on one of these, the 12 kilometer square grid, we can see how, what the changes are. So again, this is for every map explorer. We have a number, I think there are probably 30 data layers in here that we can toggle on and off, depending on what we wanna look at. I like to look at the different changes in some of these values. So, Really great tools, again, complimentary tools, publicly available. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing just to see what kind of questions or insight we have. Happy to take a look at another, you know, other specific examples if, if folks would want, but I think I've, I've done a lot of talking and I don't wanna put people to sleep. So I'm turning it back to you, Kevin. So we've just got one additional question right now in the chat, although if others have them, type them quickly. Um, the question actually is, is kind of a fun one. Uh, technical question, on the Climber app, I don't know if you know the underlying technology, but do you know if the report generating tool is a JavaScript app or something else? That question is above my knowledge. Um, I will have to take a look. I know the report generating tool, each report is unique to that 12 kilometer square grid, but it's not generating a brand new report for every time. Like each grid already has a report summarize, summarization with it. So you're just pulling that out. So I know there's an issue with like using credits to generate unique reports. This avoids that because no matter where you click in that 12 kilometer square grid, it's going to give you that same report for that area. Um, so it's just a, a huge number of reports that are in the background. And depending on where you click, that's the report that it will pull up and show you, as opposed to generating a unique report every time you want one. Fantastic. Well, I, I appreciate that. Don't see any other questions right now. Uh, Benjamin, if you want to put your contact information in the chat, people can follow up with you directly. Um, but I think everyone will agree with me and, and acknowledging the tremendous work that you and your team have done putting this together. I know it's a, a dynamic resource. You're coming out with new updates all the time. That's hard to keep up with, which is a wonderful thing. <laughs> uh, so I definitely appreciate that. Um, and you've, you've been a great supporter of ERISA. We've, we've worked together on panels and you've done a number of presentations for us. And uh, rest assured, we'll probably call on you again. Um, so I'm going to briefly share my screen and share with everyone some really exciting upcoming announcements. Give me just a moment to turn on. Here we go. Switch the display. There we go. So I hope everyone would agree with me that ERISA is a phenomenal organization that produces a lot of really important information, not only for its members, but for the broader geospatial community. One of the areas in which we try to excel in that area is in offering education. And this webinar series is one of many examples. Uh, we do have an ongoing series uh, for climate and community resilience. Uh, we have two additional seminars already scheduled, our webinars already scheduled, one coming up uh, by another person from FEMA on how geospatial technologies and data were used to create FEMA's community disaster resilient zones. If you're not familiar with that, you should be, because uh, they most definitely will impact your community and many things about it. 
Um, we also then have a team from the uh, Association of State Floodplain Managers that are going to join us on April 2nd uh, to talk about how GIS plays a role in flood hazard identification, uh, the analysis of flood risk, and solutions, not only from a technical aspect, but also from uh, current and potential up upcoming policies. Um, you know, many people know flood risk as a flood insurance rate map, but that's just the beginning, not the end. Uh, and our ASFPM colleagues will be talking about what that means. So I encourage everyone that has any sort of flood concerns, uh, past, present, or future, to, to join us for that one. And we have a number of other webinars already in the queue. I don't want to spoil the thunder. Uh, come and join us again on February 22nd, and you'll hear about those. So we're always looking for great ideas and speakers to talk about climate and community resilience. And um, I definitely don't want to miss the opportunity as well. If you're interested in this topic, you're here, so I assume you are. And you want to get involved? Um, by all means, reach out. We'd love to have you as, as part of our work group uh, to put these and many other products related to community resilience together. Uh, ERISA also acknowledges the phenomenal work in um, GIS excellence that goes on throughout the country. We, we have a series of, of well-recognized awards that we give out every year and the, the individuals presenting um, in this, rec the uh, items were identified on this slide, will be talking about what they have done with GIS and how it's made a difference in their communities. Many of these topics do deal with resilience, but they also talk about other things as well. So I encourage you to check out the ERISA website for these. Um, we do have, by the way, uh, a really cool webinar coming up on Wednesday, March 13th, and it is going to close fast in terms of your opportunity to enroll. This is on best practices when thinking about uh, the geo in geospatial data governance. That is going to be a terrific um, panel discussion. We really encourage you to join us for that one. Do not delay on signing up or you may miss your chance. And then lastly, in addition to all these terrific webinars and panels, we have many conference opportunities uh, throughout the year to give you a chance to come together and network with your colleagues and learn from them and provide information to them. Uh, the GIS Leadership Academy has uh, several offerings around the country. If you're interested in developing leadership skills, there is no better place to do that. And I encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity. If you've never been to a ERISA GIS Pro Conference, this is your opportunity. It is my favorite conference of the year. Moves around this time. It happens to be coming up in Portland, Maine. And we have a really great um, series of presentations, including many on resilience-related uh, topics coming up. So hop on the ERISA website, get ready to register for that. Hope to see you there. Um, if you're interested in addressing a public safety, we have a virtual conference coming up just this month. Uh, Cal GIS is always doing terrific things. Uh, in March 18th to 20th, they'll be having their conference uh, in Visalia, California. And last but certainly not least, uh, our GIS valuation Technologies Conference, which is always popular, is coming up from April 8 to 11. Um, if you are part of your RISA, one of the greatest things about it is the way that we manage to stay connected. Um, this is the biggest reason in my mind to be part of your RISA. You become a member of a community of experts and individuals that are passionate, that are knowledgeable, and that are willing and able to connect with others to share what they've learned and to learn from them. So take advantage of these opportunities. I could not encourage you more to do so. I really believe in what this organization does and why it does it. So with that said, I will stop sharing and uh, just close by thanking you for taking your valuable time today to join us. I hope you got as much out of this presentation as I did. Once again, Benjamin, thank you for your contribution. We truly do appreciate it. And with that, I bid you a good day. Thanks. Thank you.